Magnus Supply, 120 Industrial Boulevard. Command copies Mayday, firefighter down. Break, RIP team activation. What happened? I don't know, we went in five or six feet and he just dropped. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. All right. Well, we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks, Chief. Bye-bye. So it appears Jim was overcome by smoke. We really won't know until we get him back from the hospital and get the workup done on him. Well, I hope there's no long-term uh, damage from the exposure. Uh, the Chief just got off the phone with me, and uh, he wants to schedule a PIA for tomorrow, 8.30 at the station. Good. That'll give me enough time to go through Jim's records and see if there's anything we could have done to prevent this. Okay. So the good news is Jim's going to be OK. Oh, good. But he's going to be out a couple of weeks. And special recognition goes to our rapid intervention team. Good job, team. Now remember, let's stay aware of the hazards on the job and minimize our exposures. Keep up the good work. Thanks, Jim. Good job. Good job. My crew did a good job in handling yesterday's fire. Our response was quick, and our tactics were effective. However, we almost lost a good firefighter. Fortunately, he'll only be out a few weeks. In our post-incident analysis this morning, we looked at some of the factors that may have played a part in Jim's collapse. This incident has given us a good opportunity to review some of the occupational hazards faced by firefighters and discuss what we can do to manage and mitigate these exposures. The purpose of this program is to identify what firefighters can do to reduce their risk of contracting occupational diseases. We want all firefighters to live a quality life during their fire service careers, as well as enjoy a long and healthy retirement. SIRSA presents Occupational Disease Prevention for Firefighters. We have some great men and women here at the station, very professional and dedicated to serving and protecting our community. We have a tough job too. In our line of work, we're often exposed to smoke, air contaminants, soot, toxic chemicals, even high noise levels. Because of the unique requirements of their job, firefighters may be exposed to a myriad of different contaminants, including smoke, soot, and other hazardous materials and chemicals. Some studies indicate that firefighters may be susceptible to contract illnesses such as cardiovascular disease, respiratory ailments, cancer, and noise-induced hearing loss. Obviously, these diseases can affect our quality of life, both during our careers and after we retire. Some of these conditions are related to age, gender, or family history, while others are related to smoking, lack of exercise, or other lifestyle choices. But some studies have found a connection between certain diseases and the occupational exposure to air contaminants, soot, and high noise levels. After recognizing that continued exposure to contaminants can be detrimental to your long-term health, the next step is to adopt practices and procedures designed to prevent or control these exposures. 
Traditionally, our safety programs have centered around the protection of firefighters at fires and other incidents. But in today's environment, we need to address firefighter health issues as well. And this begins with offering comprehensive health, fitness, medical, and wellness programs. Our department has implemented a number of programs to deal with firefighter health issues. These include an occupational medical program that includes pre-placement and annual physicals, a mandatory fitness program, and educational programs such as nutrition, stress reduction, and smoking cessation. We implemented an occupational medical program a number of years ago. Before anyone begins work in our department, they have to go through an extensive medical evaluation. This includes a health history questionnaire and a comprehensive physical. We want to be sure new employees can handle the rigors of firefighting and be aware of any potential problems. We also conduct annual physicals to track the continued health of our firefighters. Results from each physical are kept in the firefighter's confidential medical file and can be reviewed by a physician to determine if any changes in their health or physical condition have occurred. In Jim's case, he's been with the department for 15 years, so he has an extensive medical history. His file will be useful to the doctors in determining his treatment. One of our paramedics on first shift is big into fitness and became certified as our fitness coordinator. He works with each crew member to set fitness goals and designs workout regimens to meet their individual goals. We also arranged memberships to the City Recreation Center for the department. Most of the firefighters go there several times a week. We even implemented an incentive program to encourage participation. Another health program we promote is proper nutrition. We have a nutritionist come in a few times each year to talk about diet and food selection. Many of the crew have committed to a healthier diet. Being a firefighter requires a lot of endurance to perform the job. So certain nutrients like carbohydrates, lean proteins, vitamins and minerals from our fruits and vegetables are going to provide the fuel that's required for that endurance so that they'll be able to serve the public. Our fitness coordinator has planned some other activities, including a stress reduction program and smoking cessation classes. We're doing our best to educate our firefighters about fitness and wellness and have implemented some good programs. Our goal is to identify and address medical issues before they become a problem in the field. A key part of preventing occupational diseases is to establish and maintain safety and health programs. We try to provide and maintain the best possible equipment, PPE, and other items to keep the job safe. We emphasize vehicle safety, since many crashes occur while responding to emergencies. Seat belt usage is strictly enforced, and our personnel are required to attend driver safety classes. You're not able to help anyone if you don't make it to the scene. Infection control procedures have been part of our protocol for years. We offer annual training classes on bloodborne pathogens and infection control techniques. We also need to be aware of potentially harmful contaminants in our own fire stations. We know that vehicle exhaust contains carbon monoxide that can kill. Fire engines and other vehicles that run on diesel fuel emit contaminants that are potentially carcinogenic. Utilize your exhaust ventilation system to reduce exposure to toxic fumes in garages, offices, and sleeping quarters. Fire stations may contain other hazardous materials including chemicals, cleaning solvents, and paint. Another potential health hazard we are exposed to is high noise. Sirens, horns, and other high noise sources on or off the job may damage your hearing over time if you do not wear hearing protection. Well, certainly in addition to the fire engines themselves and the sirens and the air horns, all that, is the equipment that we carry on those trucks. K saws, demolition saws, chain saws, air chisels, reciprocating saws. Any of that equipment generates a tremendous amount of noise on the fire ground. And it's, it's there where it's the most vital that we protect the hearing of our firefighters. It's critical that we are able to communicate with each other, especially during an emergency. In our department, 
staff who are exposed to high noise levels participate in our hearing conservation program. This includes audiometric examinations, providing hearing protective devices, and training in their proper use. Firefighters should have a number of hearing protection devices available, including earplugs and earmuffs. It's also important that they be comfortable, convenient, and fit properly. With earmuffs totally sealing over the ears, with earplugs sealing the ear canal so sound does not pass through. Our department has implemented a number of measures to address safety during fire emergencies, incidents, and even training exercises. These measures include appointing a safety officer, utilizing the incident command system, and providing on-scene monitoring of firefighters. The importance of a safety officer cannot be underestimated. In our department, our training officer serves as our department's safety officer. He is responsible for the development and coordination of our safety and health program. Some of his special functions include providing or arranging appropriate staff training, investigating on-the-job firefighter injuries, accidents, and illnesses, and recommending ways to prevent exposures, conducting facility safety inspections, coordinating our fitness and wellness programs, and evaluating our infection control program. The safety officer also compiles a year-end assessment that summarizes the number of injuries, illnesses, and vehicle accidents in our department. We use this information to look for trends and determine what areas we need to emphasize to prevent future incidents. Part of the incident command structure is utilizing an on-site safety officer. This person may or may not be the department safety officer. If none is assigned to a specific incident, the incident commander will serve as the safety officer. During an incident, the on-site safety officer monitors the scene for unsafe conditions or hazards, breaches in safety policies, and risks to firefighting personnel. Safety measures may include the need for personal protective equipment, infection control, utility disconnects, traffic control, rescue, and other controls. The on-site safety officer makes the final decision on all safety-related issues. For any fire scene, incident, or training exercise, our department uses a personnel accountability system to track firefighters at the scene. We use a simple name tag system on a board. Others may use barcodes or other methods. We maintain a rapid intervention team, or RIT. Following the minimum two in, two out system, we always have a team ready to assist fallen firefighters. We also monitor and evaluate firefighter health during incidents, such as working fires. Temperature extremes may cause fatigue, dehydration, or heat stress in a short period of time. We set up a rehab area on site to monitor vital signs of our crew during and after the incident and are prepared to administer medical treatment if necessary. Treatment may include giving IV solutions, administering oxygen, or giving hydration and nutrition as needed. An automated external defibrillator, or AED, is also available. All of these safety measures helped us during the incident with Jim yesterday. We were able to quickly identify his condition, communicate the problem, get him away from the building, and begin treatment. Having trained emergency medical personnel on scene with the necessary equipment most likely saved Jim's life. Let's talk about respiratory protection in more detail. Firefighters know that the smoke and other products of combustion contain very hazardous materials. Some contaminants, such as carbon monoxide, cause short-term or acute symptoms and can also be life-threatening. Other substances can damage the lungs and may lead to long-term effects. Some of the more common air contaminants that firefighters may be exposed to are carbon monoxide and hydrogen cyanide. Both of these replace oxygen in the bloodstream, therefore they are regarded as chemical asphyxiants. Wearing proper respiratory protection reduces the risk of both acute and chronic illnesses. Generally, we do a good job of wearing SCBA, 
and other forms of respiratory protection at fire scenes and during training. But at the fire yesterday, Jim may not have properly used his SCBA. In order to save air, he did not put on his mask until the very last second. In fact, he used to brag to younger firefighters that you're not a real fireman until you eat some smoke. Unfortunately, that attitude caught up to him yesterday. In other situations, the hazards may not be readily apparent. Take, for instance, the mop-up scene at yesterday's fire. Our crew was going through the rubble looking for hot spots, but were not wearing any type of respiratory protection. Some studies show that elevated levels of formaldehyde, hydrocarbons, and other contaminants may be present in the debris. That's why our safety officer instructed the crew to wear their respirators. Another potential exposure we face in the warmer months is from wildfires. It may not be practical to wear SCBA systems at a wildfire due to the length of time spent in the field. Some firefighters wear bandanas, but they provide minimal protection from dangerous air contaminants. Filtered masks are available that will filter out some of the contaminants. An N95 respirator is designed to filter out 95% of the soot and particulate that are common during wildfires. This N95 respirator filters out everything greater than 0.3 microns in diameter. This is fitted into the hot shield, provides respiratory protection as well as protection from heat for both the face and the neck. Our safety officer works with our firefighters to select the most appropriate respirator and to make sure it fits properly. These respirators do not filter out all contaminants or supply oxygen, so we must evaluate each situation and select the proper type of respirator to use. Each emergency is different, and you never know what you're going to run into. We've all received training on proper hazmat response, but sometimes what may seem like a relatively innocent scene could involve extremely toxic substances. Consider a potential meth lab or a storage container. All kinds of hazardous materials may be present at these sites, and we need to be prepared for the worst. This includes wearing the appropriate PPE and respirators. Another potential health hazard we need to control may be found on our bunker gear. Contaminants from a fire can cling to our clothing and equipment and should be cleaned after heavy use. We require everyone to remove contaminated clothing after an incident and store it in a designated area until it can be properly laundered. We've purchased special laundry machines to extract soot and other harmful materials. We don't want any of our people taking contaminated gear home with them and needlessly exposing their family. If you don't have access to one of these machines, launder your firefighter clothing separately from your regular clothing to avoid spreading contaminants. Soot and other materials may be absorbed into the skin and could be hazardous to your health. That's why you want to thoroughly shower after exposure to contaminants to remove residue from your skin. Here at the station, we have designated clean areas where no bunker gear, equipment, or contaminated clothing should be found. This is one way we try to protect our firefighters from contracting occupational diseases. We are fortunate in our city to have the resources needed to establish and implement a comprehensive safety and health program. But this is not the case in some of our neighboring communities. Many small fire departments may be challenged to find personnel, vehicles, and equipment to provide basic fire suppression and emergency medical services. Obtaining funding for fitness and wellness programs may take a back seat to training volunteers and acquiring needed equipment. Still, most of these departments recognize the need and benefits of the firefighter health component and are trying to address it the best they can. Oftentimes the challenges for volunteers are time. Uh, it's difficult to meet all the obligations, family, career, your volunteer life, and still be able to, to meet the expectations that, that we may have for a fitness and wellness program. Several small departments have applied for and obtained grants to fund equipment and training. 
Others have partnered with local entities and businesses to gain access to exercise facilities. Also, a wealth of fitness and wellness materials exist on the internet, and some departments do a good job of compiling and distributing that information. The internet is a wealth of information. Google, Yahoo, other search engines, you can type in practically anything on fitness and wellness, on training. It's all available and most of it's free. And uh, uh, there's no point in reinventing the wheel when you're dealing with limited resources, including personnel. Our city maintains an intergovernmental agreement with other rural fire departments in our county to allow them to use our laundry extractors to clean bunker gear. We also conduct joint training exercises and help out with the costs. Even though resources may be limited, there are ways to increase health and fitness levels of firefighters and reduce work-related illnesses. By making safety, health, and fitness a priority, you'll be able to adjust your lifestyles and work practices to reduce the risk of injury and disease. Now let's recap what we've discussed in this video. Some studies indicate that firefighters may be susceptible to certain illnesses, such as cardiovascular disease, respiratory ailments, cancer, and noise-induced hearing loss. Every department should adopt fitness and wellness programs that include annual physicals, required fitness routines, and educational programs. Get involved and encourage your fellow firefighters to do the same. Establish and maintain safety and health programs. Follow all safe driving policies and infection control procedures. Identify and control contaminants in the fire station, such as vehicle emissions, chemicals, cleaning solvents, and paint. Anticipate and reduce high noise levels and wear proper hearing protective devices. Implement measures to address health and safety during fire emergencies, incidents, and training exercises, including appointing a safety officer, utilizing the incident command system, using a personnel accountability system, maintaining a rapid intervention team, and providing an on-site rehab area for firefighters. Wear proper respiratory protection to reduce the risk of acute and chronic illnesses. Know the uses and applications for different filters and respirators, and always prepare for potentially hazardous situations. Properly clean equipment after exposure to contaminants, and launder bunker gear and clothing after heavy use. Take a shower after exposure to remove residue from your skin, and keep your living quarters free from contaminants. And even if your resources are limited, there are things you can do to maintain a safe workplace and healthy lifestyle. As a firefighter, you may be exposed to a number of different contaminants throughout your career. It's important to use personal protective equipment to minimize your exposures and to prevent occupational disease. It's a tremendous challenge to implement fitness and wellness programs for small departments, but yet it's something we really need to try and do. It's very important that we encourage our volunteers, all of our firefighters, to participate in these programs so we have fewer cardiac-related deaths in the fire service every year. When we commit to safe and healthful practices, both on and off the job, we can accomplish the goal of providing our community with quality fire and emergency medical services. And just as important, good health will help us enjoy life for years to come. Good luck, and let's all stay healthy.